We are in session four of the book of Deuteronomy. Since several of the chapters are a little shorter, we're going to go from, from chapters seven through ten. Don't let that terrify you. Some of those are fairly short chapters, and um, it should take. We, I suspect uh, it should take a better part of an hour. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter seven, verse one: When the Lord thy God should, this again, Moses is continuing his recount of history putting his, his editorial emphasis on the fact of what God wants us, you and I, also to learn from these experiences. But he continues his historical rundown here. He says, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land where thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Gergesites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier, mightier than thou, when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show, show mercy uh, with them. Now, the point of this opening series of verses is, to is that Israel would destroy all the nations within the borders of Canaan. The, uh, the, uh, we've talked already about it. We'll talk some more about this business of um, Destroying every man, woman, and child of these certain nations. That shocks us. It seems uh, uh, so uh, uh, offensive, uh, unethical for a loving God to do that. But we need to understand the full context to keep in mind the, you know, the, the, the whole situation here. Um, also realize that Moses is encouraging them because he remembers that 38 years ago, when they had the same chance, their knees buckled and they said, no way, and they didn't have the guts to go forward. So he's trying to emphasize to them that God is committed to them succeeding. Don't panic. We're going in there. He's dealing with the next generation. It's their, the, 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 the guys that are there now, it was their dads that blew it and didn't survive as a result of that. Now this whole issue of tribal genocide bothers us. But we need to know several things. In Deuteronomy 9, we're going to emphasize the fact that these, nation, these, these seven nations that occupy the land deserve to die for their sin. They deserved to die. They were. They were. They were. Uh, uh, hate, they had hated the God that has made their co his covenant with the nation of Israel, and they not only deserved to die for their sin, they persisted in their hatred of God. And then, and the, the, these verses in Daniel's in, in Daniel in Deuteronomy seven uh, is going to emphasize that. And uh, these the Canaanites as a group, these seven nations, constitute a moral cancer that endangered God's covenant people. And Deuteronomy 20 is going to deal with that. And, of course, Numbers 33 and Joshua 23 also deal with this. And, by the way, if this all offends you, you've got to realize something. Jesus Christ is going to return to slaughter the unrepentant upon the earth, the unrepentant wicked. And uh, some, occasionally, not too often, you'll see a little bumper sticker, Jesus coming again soon, and boy is he angry. <laughs> and it's a little irrelevant, uh, irreverent, I think, in many my, people's mind, but, but it's, uh, it happens to be scripturally right. There's going to be a very big contrast between the second coming and the first coming, where Jesus came to fulfill his mission in our place. But uh, the, the, our kinsman redeemer, has that coin has a flip side. It's called the avenger of blood. And when he comes back, he comes back as a warrior. In fact, we'll see him, he, he is going to be drenched in blood. Not his blood, that was shed at the cross. The blood of his enemies. Read Revelation 19. Read Isaiah 63, and so forth. And uh, it'll become very vivid. Let's, well, let's move on. Verse seven, verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 3. Neither shalt thou make marriages with him. You, thy daughter shall not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. It is imperative for the survival of the nation, for them to keep themselves separate, to fulfill the mission that God has for them. Their survival individually and collectively depend on that. That's what Moses is saying here. But thus shall ye deal with them. Ye shall destroy their altars, break down their images, Cut down their groves, that's the Ashtoreth, these, these phallic symbols that were part of their fertility cults, and burn their graven images with fire. Do you notice the very tactful multicultural attitude here? Do you, under, do you realize that we have to just accommodate, the, and of course I'm being facetious here. No, this is different, this is, this is, this is black and white stuff. I'm reminded of a conversation in the in, in entertainment context when, in the, where the, uh, the young operative was talking to his CIA boss, uh, talking about the old days. 
And he said to the old guy, speaking of the World War II era and so forth, he said, Do you miss the old days, sir? He says, I miss their clarity. I miss their clarity. And I, it always echoes in my ears. You know, it's interesting. There was a time, as recently as the Second World War, where things were sort of black and white, good and bad. It's amazing to see how blurred that is today. It was pretty clear here. You shall deal, how you, here's how you deal with them. You're going to destroy their altars, break down their images, cut down their groves, and burn their graven images of fire. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Wow! No wonder the world hates the Jew. Because they are ordained by the God of the universe to be a special people. And the world, who doesn't accept that, regards that just as an excuse to, you know, to be officious and what have you. But of all the people that are upon the face of the earth, that's a heavy trip. In spite of that, they are going to blow it in spades. And we're building up to that. The Lord did not set His love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any other people. For ye were the fewest of all people. See, it wasn't because they were powerful, they were large, or they were this or that. It was God's sovereignty that chose them. But because the Lord loved you, and because He would keep the oath which He had sworn unto your fathers, aha, there's another reason, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. These people were beneficiaries of a redemption that God had promised he swore to their fathers he would do this. You and I are beneficiaries of a similar kind of promise that he made to Jesus Christ. Every benefit we have is a function of God keeping his promises that he has given us in Christ. There is a parallel, but we won't, let's, not, let's keep moving. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, and the faithful God which keepeth the covenant and the mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. And repay of them that hate him to their face. To destroy them, he will not be slack to him that hateth him. He will repay him to his face. See, the Lord alone is God. He's able to control history and um, to raise up nations to bring them down. God is in charge. He's in control. He's also a faithful God. The same God has, a, and obviously this thousand generations thing is, an, is, a, is a, a, a rhetorical device meaning, you know, in effect, Endlessly or forever. It's a, it, it's, a figure, it's, it's a figure of speech. But anyway, we move on. Thou shalt therefore keep the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which I command thee this day to do them. Wherefore it shall come to pass, if ye hearken to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which he sware unto thy fathers. That's the good news. <laughs> And he will love thee, and bless thee, and multiply thee, and also bless the fruit of thy womb, and the fruit of thy land, thy corn, thy wine, thine oil, the increase of thy kind, the fl flocks of thy sheep, and the land which he sware unto thy fathers to give thee. Thou shalt be blessed above all people. There shall not be male or female barren among you, nor among your cattle. The Lord will take away from thee all sickness, and will put none of the evil diseases of Egypt which thou knowest upon thee but will lay them upon all them that hate thee. There's a very interesting book that was published many years ago called None of These Diseases, a phrase, of course, of out of Exodus by uh, Dr. Milliken, who went through medical history. And it's a shock to realize a couple of things. One is, it's amazing uh, uh, when you, uh, first of all, from the uh, Papyrus Ibris, if you look at the ancient re recordings that we have of the medical practices of ancient Egypt, they're really weird. They're really, <laughs> they're really grotesque. What's amazing about them isn't the ignorance that they portray. What's interesting is that Moses was taught in that culture, and none of that shows up in the Torah. All these weird concepts they had medicine, they're not in the Torah. In contrast to that, there are hygiene issues. There are, uh, there are all kinds of things that the Jews do not get. You, there's a cervical cancer issue that derives favorably from the fact that they're circumcised. There's, all, there's medical study after medical study after medical study. One of the most interesting ones is the circumcision on the eighth day. 
If you do medical graphs of, what is it, vitamin K and prothrombin, anyway, it turns out that if you're going to circumcise a child, if you do it before the eighth day or after the eighth day, you can encourage great bleeding. But by doing it on the eighth day, it's optimum to, to, to make it safest. Now, what's interesting about that, how did Moses know? Trial and error? <laughs> I don't think so. It's interesting that the medical insights that pervade the Torah are astonishing. If you, and and the, there are books written, and, and Milliken's book was just one example. I was very intrigued with that. But none of these diseases, all these diseases of Egypt that they were familiar with, they were kept from by God, and in part by the hygiene and by the rules which he institutes in the Torah. But uh, anyway, move on. And thou shalt consume all the people which the Lord thy God shall deliver thee. Thine eyes shall have no pity upon them. Neither shalt thou serve their gods, for they will be a snare unto thee. If thou shalt say in thine heart, These nations are more than I, how can I dispossess them? Thou shalt not be afraid of them, but shalt well remember what the Lord thy God did unto Pharaoh and all Egypt. Boy, you know, I often, it sounds a little reverent, but I almost feel when I read uh, Exodus, it's almost as if God's showing off. You know, one thing after the another, you go Exodus, you, the, you, you, climaxing, of course, in the death of the firstborn. But you go through that. It, 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 uh, God seemed to be going out of his way to demonstrate that he was God. And uh, there's no way you can rationalize by circumstance. All kinds of scholars have tried to rationalize the events of Egypt um, uh, in, in nationalist, naturalistic terms by comets or all kinds of conjectures. No, God was so vivid. So, you know, that's, he wiped out the firstborn of the animals, not just the, 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 the people of Egypt. And so it, 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 it's an incredible story. That's why Friday the 13th is so unlucky. Did you know that? Did you realize that? When did the Passover take place? 14th of Nisan. Okay. Now, the, 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 it, was, it was a Shabbat. It was, uh, uh, but when, when does Shabbat start? Not a, you know, at, at the next day starts at sundown. So what's the 14th of Nisan to the Hebrews is the thir Friday the 13th to the Egypt. So Friday the 13th is the Gentile side of the Passover. And interesting, we're indebted to Vilikowski of all people for that insight. But anyway, move on. The great temptations with thine eyes saw, the signs and the wonders and the mighty hand and the stretched out arm whereby the Lord thy God brought thee out, so shall the Lord thy God do unto all the people of whom thou art afraid. So you're worried about these Rephaim, you're worried about the Nephilim, these giants, whatever. Don't sweat it. God can deal with it. And these are all things that were true, by the way, 38 years ago. But they just wouldn't listen. They were terrified. And Moses is reminding them of all this, that this generation should uh, uh, go, in, in, go forward in victory. Moreover, the Lord thy God will send the hornet among them, until they that are left and hide themselves from thee be destroyed. Now, there are some scholars who think this is just an idiom, you know, uh, 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 idiomatic. Some believe they're little hornets. I won't argue that one way or the other. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the idea that God's uh, enemies will run as if they're attacked by swarms of hornets. That can be uh, uh, taken literally. Uh, or others say it can, be, it can make reference to the way the Egyptian army was taken. But whatever. And thou shalt be affrighted at them. For the Lord thy God is among you, and the mighty hand, uh, a mighty God, and terrible. And the Lord thy God will put out those nations before thee by little and little. Thou mayest not consume them at once, lest the beasts of the field increase upon thee. <laughs> That's interesting. Now, you realize what he's saying? You're not going to wipe out all those seven nations at one time, because you can't handle it all. The wild beasts and stuff will multiply. You won't be able to handle the turf. So you're going to take them little by little, so you can manage it. And meanwhile... Your enemies will keep the wild beasts under control. In other words, you're not going to bite off more than you can chew. Is really what they're what he's saying here. I think that's I think it's interesting. You may as not, not consume it once, lest the beasts of the field increase upon thee. But the Lord thy God shall deliver them unto thee, and shall destroy them with a mighty destruction until they be destroyed. The truth of the matter is, the enemies were fearful, fearful of Israel. We find that in Exodus 15, Numbers 22, Joshua 2. And five, remember, remember Rahab the harlot, and, and, and she, she was, she'd heard, she's terrified. Uh, the, the, their reputations preceded them. And uh, so uh, God would throw the enemy, Israel's enemies into confusion. And uh, we're going to see that mentioned here subsequently too. And so God inspired panic would engulf the Canaanites and uh, render them helpless in battle. And all this would happen uh, by a well-conceived plan. That's what this little by little implies. 
and so that the land would not be depopulated too quickly and be overrun by wild beasts and so on. And he shall deliver their kings into thy hands, and thou shalt destroy their name from under heaven. There shall no man be able to stand before thee until thou hast destroyed them. And of course, all this comes true, and it comes to pass in the book of Joshua. The graven images of their gods shall ye burn with fire, and thou shalt not desire the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it unto thee, lest thou be snared therein. For it is an abomination to the Lord thy God. So they weren't, to tra apparently, not, not to recapture the precious metals that were involved, just to destroy it. That's exactly what Moses will do to the golden calf. He doesn't destroy the gold. He, he, he destroys all of it. It was an abomination as far as he's concerned. Neither shalt thou bring an abomination to thine house, lest thou be cur a cursed thing like it. But thou shalt utterly detest it, and thou shalt utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. You may remember at Ai, that, um, this all comes later, of course, but uh, at Ai, the, 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 the Achan hung on to something he wasn't supposed to, and for that reason they got clobbered. The whole nation got punished because this one guy didn't obey this. And uh, we should take this to heart. Not that we're under the law, but it says you should not bring an abomination into thine house. A cult object should not be in your, your house. I'm not talking about artifacts, uh, the, the, the harmless thing. I'm talking about occult objects. Thou shalt not bring an abomination to thine house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it. Thou shalt utterly detest it, and thou shalt utterly abhor it, for it is what? A cursed thing. And so that ends chapter 7. Let's get to chapter 8. Now we're going to have a war warning against the spirit of independence. This is something that jeopardizes all of us, and it jeopardizes America right now. We have a military that's distinguished itself, made military history in its effectiveness, its professionalism, its technology. Incredible, incredible accomplishments in this uh, recent war in Iraq. And the danger is we can get prideful. David has made, made his major problems on the heels of victory when he renumbered the people. So we need to remember, watch, out, watch out for pride. We have you can justifiably proud of our military in many respects. We need to be careful that we don't fall in that same trap. Deuteronomy 8, verse 1, All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness, to humble thee, to prove thee, to know what is in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or not. Now, the, the, these, these uh, challenges they had during the 40 years of the wilderness weren't to show God something he didn't know. That's a, what they call an anthropomorphism or a rhetorical device. To show them what's in their heart. Do you follow me? Just to know what was in thy heart. For them to know. God knew what was in their heart. Whether he would keep his commandments or not. He knew that. He knew there was going to have to be a Redeemer. He knew that they would get themselves a predicament that nothing less than the death of God himself would suffice to repair the damage. And that's what Christ is all about. But that was ordained back in Eden, Genesis 3. That's, a, that's hidden in the text of the genealogy of Genesis 5. Man has appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing comfort of rest. That's the genealogy. If you translate the, the names in, in the first ten from, from Adam to Noah. Interesting. No, God's plan was not a knee-jerk reaction after over some of He knew in advance what was coming, what it would take to redeem these people. Because he knew in the ultimate it would be to his glory. He loved us that much. He, the real mystery in the Bible is how, why he loves us so much. He sure does. Anyway, uh, so they went through this trial. He humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only. But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the, of the Lord doth man live. The whole wilderness, the whole 38-year experience that this nation has gone through was deliberately designed by God so they would understand that it's only by their dependence on Him they would survive. They couldn't fabricate. It was not the kind of wilderness where you could raise food. God provided it. And that's the way God wants us to be in, in response to Him. There's a danger when we become independent. There's a danger when we become self-reliant, that we fail to look at Him. And one of the re he, 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 there's, a, there's a risk to our spiritual welfare when we become self-reliant. He goes on to say, Thy raiment waxed not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell those forty years. Can you imagine? Their shoes didn't wear out. Forty years. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. 
When a father expresses the love for his son by uh, disciplining, you know how he loves that son. He destroys the son by being passive and ignoring his faults. No, he should deal with them. And our father is a loving father. He loves us so much he won't let that go without being dealt with. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of the hills, valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of oil, olive and honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness, thou shalt not lack anything in it, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. All these things, by the way, have been discovered there, and it's all, it turns out to be very, very descriptive. But Moses didn't know that at the time. This is inspired. We, since we take this all for granted because we know Israel today. But uh, this was written by Moses before he died. And he didn't enter the land. He only saw it from Mount Nebo. Verse 10, When thou hast eaten and art full, and when thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee, beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command thee to say. You know, this, what Moses is saying here, hey guys, watch it. When you're prosperous, you're gonna, you've had a tough time, that's been for good reason. But now that you're going to go in and prosper and you're going to conquer these nations, you're going to have all this food and all this, this fabulous land, don't forget God. You know, how interesting it is that our country is founded by people who are seeking the freedom of worship. People that came here and founded a nation on, on godly principles. The Constitution, Declaration of Independence, all these things are God-breathed documents. They're based on, they were, they were, they were uh, penned and formulated by brilliant geniuses that were God-fearing. And uh, in those early years, they understood the heritage that they were laying down for their posterity. And it's really a shock to realize now that we are prosperous, we're forgetting it, we're turning it back. Same thing happened to Israel here, same thing happened to the Northern Kingdom. When, the, when uh, Jeroboam rebelled against Rehoboam, they separated the northern ho the house of Israel. They prospered. Jeroboam's ar standing army conquered all the way to Damascus. They were very prosperous. God sent Hosea to them. You guys think it's the best of times. In God's eyes, it's the worst of times. You've abandoned two centuries of heritage. And uh, you've exchanged your heritage for worshiping idols. That's brought you social injustice and violence and so forth and so on. The whole indictment list. If you study Hosea from chapter 4 through 14, it's a description of the United States. Also, we too have had two centuries of heritage. We've abandoned it. We've forgotten the God that made it possible. And uh, it's very possible he's going to give, it has the same indictment against us that Hosea had against the North Kingdom. Same kind. The danger, beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in keeping his commandments, his judgments, and statutes, which I command thee to say. You know, it's amazing how empires have been studied. Empires have a life cycle. They go from bondage to faith, and from faith to freedom, and from freedom to abundance, and then from abundance to complacency, from complacency to apathy, apathy to dependency, and dependency back to bondage. It takes about two centuries, and that's been the history of mankind. And the United States looks like it's, where are we on that cycle? We're beyond, you know, bondage and faith and abundance. Are we moving to complacency and apathy? Are we going to move towards dependency? Will that plunge us back into bondage? That would be the pattern, wouldn't it? Lest thou, when thou hast eaten and art full, and hast built goodly houses, and dwelt therein, and when thy herds and flocks multiply, and thy silver and gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up, uh -oh, and thou shalt forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt, and from the house of bondage who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water and brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna which thy fathers knew not, and that he might humble thee, that he might prove thee to do thee good at the latter end. And thou say in thine heart, My power and might of mine hand hath gotten me this health. Be careful. That's what brought Nebuchadnezzar down. He's on the top of the wall of, his, of, of Babylon. It was considered impregnable by all the experts of that era. Look what I did. And God struck him down, just as he predicted. And of course, Daniel took care of him for seven years as he went through this, his uh, institutionalization until he recovered from all of that. 
Watch out when you're saying in your heart, my power and, my, and the might of my hand hath gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he may swear unto thy fathers, as it is this day. And shall be that if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other gods, and serve them, and worship them, I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish. Boy, that's pretty clear. There isn't any technical ambiguities about the language. Ye shall surely perish perish. He's speaking individually and collectively. As the nations which the Lord hath destroyeth before your face, so shall ye perish, because ye would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. Moses is building this up because he's about to describe their tendencies. He's not through here. We're going to we're going, see, chapter 8 is followed by chapter 9. <laughs> Now we're going to talk about a, a warning against spirit of self-righteousness. This is a different thing, but sim a close cousin. Chapter 9, verse 1. Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day, to go in to possess nations greater and mightier than thyself, cities great and fenced up to heaven, a people great and tall, and people of the Anakims. Remember we talked about the Anakims. Most people don't understand. That these were not just tribal things. These were Rephaim. These were vestiges of the Nephilim and so on. Whom thou knowest, and of whom thou hast heard say, Who can stand before the children of Anak? That was the way they assessed these people. They were, it was, they, they uh, uh, were, were terrified. Understand therefore this day, that the Lord thy God is he which goeth over before thee as a consuming fire, he shall destroy them. And he shall bring them down before thy face, so thou shalt drive them out and destroy them quickly, as the Lord hath said unto thee. He's anticipating the same reactions by the young men they're going to have to face these guys as the young men did 38 years earlier. They're terrified of what they're up against. He's saying, no, no, understand, God has committed to go before you. He's going to take care of this for you. Trust Him. You know, it's interesting, the whole issue here is trusting God. God finds a new way to ask us each day, you and I, do you trust me? God finds a new way almost every day to ask you that question. And uh, that's what he's after. Do you trust him? Speak not thou in thine heart, after the Lord thy God hath cast them out from before thee, saying, For my righteousness the Lord hath brought me to, in to possess this land. But for the wickedness of these nations the Lord doth drive them out from before thee. See, he, God's going to go before them, but not because they merit it. He's going to do this thing, but not because they deserve it, it's because God promised he'd do it. Not for thy righteousness... Or for the uprightness of your heart dost thou go to possess their land. But for the wickedness of those nations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee, that he may perform the word which the Lord sware unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God told Abraham that for, their, for 400 years your people are going to be in Egypt, but then they're going to come back. For 400 years they're going to come back. And God promised to rid this land of its... See, the, the flip side of this is Satan had four centuries laid down a minefield. When God told Abraham, your people are going to come back here 400 years from now, Satan could say, boy, I've got 400 years to lay down a minefield to thwart the plan of God. And that's the, that, that's the undergirding strategic thing that's going on with these seven nations, the four special tribes, the Emin, the, Ramin, the, the Rephaim, the walking dead that were there. Now, for the wickedness of those nations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out before thee, that he may perform the word which the Lord swear unto thy fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Again, God, they're, they're getting the victory, not because they deserve it, not because they're righteous, but because God promised their fathers He would do this. It's God's faithfulness that's the issue, not ours. Understand, therefore, that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness, <laughs> for thou art a stiff-necked people. Now, that's not written in some anti-Semitic tract. That's in the Word of God. That's Moses' assessment. Thou art a stiff-necked people. Their hearts are hard to change. Their attitudes are rigid. They're, they're, they're very self-willed. That's what's involved here. Now you think they are. We are too. So when you, the, guy, the, the, the most stiff-necked person you're probably going to see in your life is the one you shave every morning. Guys, okay. Remember, and forget not, how thou provokest the Lord thy God to wrath in the wilderness from the day that thou didst depart out of the land of Egypt until ye came to this place, ye have been rebellious against the Lord. See, now, after this buildup, he's going to nail them. He's going to tell them, let's remember what the history was like. 
Also in Horeb, that's at Mount Sinai, ye provoked the Lord to wrath, so that the Lord was angry with you to have destroyed you. God was going to wipe them out. Moses says, when I was going up to the mount to receive the tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant which the Lord made with you, then I abode in the mount forty days and forty nights. By the way, it's a long time. Think about it. Camping up the mountain, unprepared probably, for forty days and forty nights. I did neither did eat bread nor drink water. It's a long time. By the way, he does this twice. He's going to do this twice. I was going up to the mount to receive the table of stone. I bowed the mount forty days and forty nights, neither did I eat bread or drink water. And the Lord delivered unto me the two tables of stone, written with the finger of God. Wow. And on them was written according to all the words which the Lord spake with you in the mount of the, of the midst of the fire in the, in, in the day of the assembly. And it came to pass at the end of the forty days and forty nights that the Lord gave me the two tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant. And by the way, most people assume, <laughs> it's a trivial thing, but that the two tables had half the laws in one and half in the other. No, both of them probably had the complete laws. The style in the ancient time, if you had a, ser a serious covenant, was to have two copies. It came to pass at the end of forty days, forty nights, the Lord gave me the two tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant. And the Lord said unto me, Arise, get thee down quickly from thence, for thy people which thou brought out of Egypt have corrupted themselves, and they are quickly turned aside out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them an old image. You know, while Moses is up there forty days and forty nights with God, what's going down in the camp? Revelry, partying. And they con Aaron to build this golden calf. You know the story. <laughs> he says, gee, it just came out of the fire like this. Eh? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Furthermore, the Lord spake unto me, saying, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. There it is again. <laughs> God's opinion seems to be the same as Moses. Let me alone, that I may destroy them. This is God speaking. Let me alone, that I may destroy them, and blot out their name from under heaven. This is God speaking about Israel. And I will make of thee a nation mightier and greater than they. So God is actually, he's actually putting Moses to the test, but he's saying, I am fed up with these guys. They've gone down there and corrupted themselves and making this golden calf. I'm going to wipe them all out and start over. I'm going to make, a, uh, I'm going to make a, 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 of thee, Moses, a nation even mightier than they. That's an interesting deal. Gee, God, that, that'd be pretty neat. Moses says, so I turned and came down from the mount, and the mount burned with fire, and the two tables of the covenant were in my two hands. And I looked, and behold, he sinned against the Lord your God, and he made you a molten calf. He had turned aside quickly out of the way which the Lord had commanded you. And I took the two tables and cast them out of my two hands and break them before your eyes. Why? Because they had broken the covenant. The covenant was broken, not by Moses breaking the thing, by them, by turning against God. He just got through this whole thing. He's up there 40 days, 40 nights getting the details, and he's, they're down there, and he's, his back is he, he, he's hardly turned when they're in it. Doing what? Doing exactly what God said not to do. So as far as, and by the way, God did regard that covenant as broken. He's going to, read, he's going to give him a new, he's going to make a new one shortly, but the point is that those two tables of stones symbolize the breaking of that covenant. It was kaput. I took the two tables, cast them out of my two hands, and break them before your eyes. He talked to, he's talking to the people he's talking to. And I fell down before the Lord as at the first 40 days and 40 nights. So he does another 40 days and 40 nights here, guys. I, did either, I neither did eat bread nor drink water because of all your sins which he sinned in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And I was afraid of the anger and the hot displeasure wherewith the Lord was wroth against you to destroy you. But the Lord hearkened unto me at that time also. See, Moses prayed for the people. His, 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 he prayed for the people. The Lord was very angry with Aaron to have destroyed him. Even his you know, brother Aaron. I prayed for Aaron also at the same time, he says. That's the only place, by the way, that's mentioned. And I took your sin, the calf which ye had made, and burnt it with fire, and stamped it, and ground it very small, even until it was just small as dust. And I cast the dust thereof into the brook that descended out of the mount. So that was the golden calf. You all know the point is that the golden calf thing is right. And that's not the end of it. He then goes on. There's been a lot of other cases as they wandered in the wilderness. At Tabera, at Massa, and at Kibra of Hatatava. 
they, he provoked the Lord to wrath. And uh, the incident at Taborah, that was uh, the people were complaining about their hardships and, and God uh, uh, burned, burned them at the fringes of the camp. The word Taborah means burning, by the way. And uh, at, um, what was the other one here? Uh, at Massa. Uh, that's, that was where they were complaining about the uh, no water. And they struck the rock and they got the water and so forth. And uh, at uh, Kibroth Hata Ava, uh, that, that, means the, the graves of lust is what it translates into. That's where they, uh, they didn't like the manna, so they asked for quail. We gave them plenty of quail, and they so gorged themselves in the quail that they got sick and many of them died. And because, and again, uh, again, always complaining rather than being grateful, always complaining, murmuring. And incident after incident, there are lots of incidents. Here's three that he just summarized at Taborah, at Massa. And this is, this is all familiar to them, of course, as part of their history. It says, Likewise, when the Lord sent you from Kadesh Barnea, saying, Go up and possess the land which I've given you. And then you rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God and believed him not, nor hearkened unto his voice. They were at Kadesh Barnea. They, 38 years ago, you could have gone in, and God was ready to deliver it to you, and you wouldn't take it. Boy, it must be frustrating. You know what's even more frustrating? When God promises in the Garden of Eden that he's going to bring a deliverer, and he goes, goes through centuries of prophets detailing everything about him, his genealogy and what family and, and where he's going to be born, and all the details of his life, the Messiah. When the Messiah comes, they crucify him. They crucify him. You know, there's a very interesting summary of, uh, of Hebrew history by Stephen in the book of Acts, Acts 7. Stephen, the young man, has the audacity to give the Sanhedrin a Hebrew lesson. <laughs> But he goes through and recounts a similar history. But he makes an interesting point because they don't let him finish. So many people don't understand where he was headed. But if you take Acts 7 and outline his logic, he always points out that Israel always blows it the first time, they get it the second. Blows it the first time, they get it the second. They blow it the first time, they get it the second. And he gets to the resurrection. And they don't let him finish to get him so upset, they, they go and stone him. What are they saying? They blew it the first time, his first coming. But they'll get it. On the second coming. It's the pattern of Israel. Interesting, isn't it? You have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. Thus I fell down before the Lord forty days and forty nights as I fell down to the first. Because the Lord has said he would destroy you. God was going to destroy Israel. And it's Moses that's interceding. We have Moses in the role of an intercessor. You have an intercessor too. You know who that is? Who's your intercessor? Not Moses. Who's your intercessor? Jesus. Can you imagine the Son of God spending his, his primary duty right now before the Father is to intercede on your behalf? Is he going to be more effective than Moses? I think so. Was Moses adequate? He sure was, because God didn't wipe out that nation. Because Moses interceded. And he did it on the basis of God's glory. Not because he deserved it. His arguments are very interesting. God, don't. If you, if, if you wipe out this nation and start over, all the nations will say, ha, see, you couldn't do what, they, what he promised to do. Interesting logic. I prayed therefore unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, destroy not thy people and thine inheritance, which thou hast redeemed through thy greatness, which thou hast brought forth out of Egypt with mighty hand. Remember thy servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Look not to the stubbornness of this people, nor to their wickedness, nor to their sin. Now remember your promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he's saying. But you notice he points out that it was God's greatness that redeemed, not the people deserved it. Lest the land whence thou brought us out, get this, lest the land whence thou brought us out, say, because the Lord was not able to bring them into the land which he promised them. And because he hated them, he hath brought them out to slay them in the wilderness. Moses is arguing before the Lord, hey, people don't deserve to be, they deserve to be wiped out. But what are your enemies going to say? They're going to say you couldn't cut it. You couldn't deliver the land like you promised. Yet, Moses continued, yet they are thy people and thine inheritance, which thou broughtest out by thy mighty, by thy mighty power, power and by thy uh, thy stretched out arm. Interesting logic, Moses. Well, let's take one more and we'll wrap it up here. Chapter 10. At that time the Lord said unto me, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and come up unto me into the mount, and make thee an ark of wood. And they will do that later. That will become the ark of the covenant later. And I will write upon the tables the words that, thou, that were in the first tables, which thou breakest, and thou shalt put them in the ark. So God is going to make a new set of tables, Tablets, and that's a new covenant. It'd be the same words, but it's a it's a it's a restart, if you will. God decides not to destroy him 
in effect, you know, to, to give them another chance. And I made an ark of shittim wood and hewed two tables of stone like unto the first and went up to the mount, having the two tables in mine hand. And he wrote on the tables according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord spake unto you in the mount, out of the midst of the fire on the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them unto me. And I turned myself and came down from the mount and put the tables in the ark which I had made. And there they be as the Lord commanded me. And the children of Israel took their journey from Beeroth of the children of Jachin to Masera, where Aaron died, and there he was buried. And Eleazar's son ministered in the priest's office in his stead. And uh, now this may be an editorial insertion. Some scholars point out that because this involves some things that happened later. And uh, uh, Israel was in Masera when uh, Aaron died, according to Numbers 20 and 33. He died on Mount Hor. So Masera might be the district that uh, Mount Hor was located in. That's speculation. Eliezer's Aaron's third son became the high priest in Deuteronomy uh, uh, from Deuteronomy 10.6 and uh, the Levites were then given specific responsibilities uh, 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 as in relation to the tabernacle and so forth to be a priest you had to be the son of Aaron but the other Levites were given other tasks and so forth and from thence they journeyed to Gudgoda and from Gudgoda to Jotbath uh, the land of the rivers of waters. At that time, the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister unto him, and to bless in his name unto this day. Wherefore, Levi hath no part nor inheritance with his brethren. The Lord is his inheritance, according to the Lord thy God promised him. You may recall when the twelve tribes go into the land under Joshua, and after they conquer the land, um, eleven of the twelve tribes get land allocated to them. But Levites, the Levites didn't inherit land. God was their inheritance. But what they did get is 48 cities, six of which were designated as cities of refuge and so forth. And as you go through all that, let me also warn you, if you haven't noticed it before, there's not 12 tribes or 13. Um, the tribe of Joseph was entitled to a double portion. His sons were Ephraim and Manasseh. So you've actually got 13 tribes to play with. So you can take 12 tribes and leave one out and always have 12. <laughs> So when you want a marching order of 12 tribes, you leave out Levites, they don't go to war, you still have 12 tribes because you got Ephraim and Manasseh. If you want to count Levi and still have 12, you count it the tribe of Joseph. You put the two together. You follow me? So you'll discover the, the, tri the 12 tribes are listed 20 times in the Bible, each time in a different order. Each time there's a different one left out for different reasons. Um, and, each, and there's a lesson in each one of those. So I'll leave that. But just recognize the reason that works you can leave one out and still have 12 is because you've really got an alphabet of 13. So Baker's dozen, if you will. So uh, we'll move on. Okay. And the Lord said unto me, Arise, take thy journey before thy people, that they may go in and possess the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give unto them. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear God, uh, to, uh, to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to love him, and to serve thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul? Doesn't this remind you of a very famous passage in Micah 6 8? What doth the Lord require? He has showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee? But to do justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. That's the long and the short of it. That's what God expects. He wants us to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. If you're not Jewish, it doesn't say you take under the Jewish laws on your shoulder, but he still expects you to love him with all your heart, with all your soul. To keep the commandments of the Lord and the statutes which I command thee this day for thy good. Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's thy God, and the earth also with all that therein is. Only the Lord hath delight in thy fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, even you above all people, as it is this day. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. Strange phrase. We think of circumcision as dealing with a totally different organ of the body. But that's the circumcision of the flesh. He's using the term idiomatically here. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of what? Your heart. You mean going there with a scalpel? No, 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 no. Anyway. You, you, you've got to, to, to soften your heart. You've got to have your heart right with the Lord. Circumcision was the instituted, instituted uh, symbol of the covenant, yes. But he's talking about have the covenant in your heart. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart, the, and be no more stiff-necked. For the Lord your God is a God of gods, and the Lord of lords, and a great God, a mighty and a terrible, and he guardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. He doth execute the judgment of the fathers and the widow, and loveth the stranger in giving him food and raiment. Love ye therefore the stranger. By the way, this is one of the things. See, you love ye therefore the stranger, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. That's why they were instructed that when they had a non-Jew among them for some reason, treat him with hospitality. Why? Because you were once strangers in a strange land. See? 
Love ye therefore the stranger, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, thou shalt, uh, thou, him shalt thou serve, and to him shalt thou cleave, and swear by his name. He is thy praise, and he is thy God, and he that hath done for thee these great and terrible things which thine eyes have seen. Thy fathers went down into Egypt with threescore and ten persons. And now the Lord thy God hath made thee as the stars of heaven for multitude. That was what he promised to do back in Genesis 15 and Genesis 17, and Genesis 26. Those phrases turn, make thee as the stars of multitude. It's interesting that the fathers went down to Egypt with 70 people. And, and elsewhere in, in, in Genesis 10 we find that the, nation, that the nations of the world were numbered as 70 in the Torah, in the, in the book of Genesis chapter 10. And uh, this is a, a, a point of some confusion among some scholars because when we look at um, Genesis 46 in verses 26 and 27, it reads, All the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt, which came out of his loins, besides Jacob's sons' wives, all the souls were threescore and six. And the sons of Joseph, which were born him in Egypt, were two souls. And all the souls of the house of Jacob, which came into Egypt, were threescore and ten. Now this is further confounded by the fact that when you get to the New Testament, and Stephen is giving his summary of the Old Testament before the Sanhedrin. You know, that, that's, a, that's quite a scene. Here's this young deacon uh, presuming, this is what we call in Hebrew, chutzpah. <laughs> this young man is giving the Sanhedrin a lesson in uh, Old Testament history. In fact, Acts chapter 7 is an incredible commentary on the Old Testament. It's worthy of a very careful study because there's a half a dozen things in that chapter you won't find in the Old Testament. We learn a great deal about the Old Testament from Stephen's presentation. But just to focus on one thing, in verse 14 of Acts 7, uh, Stephen says to them, Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him and all his kindred, threescore and fifteen souls. So here we have yet another number. And this has caused a lot of confusion to the average Bible uh, st uh, student. Um, Genesis 46, 26 uh, speaks of 66 going down to Egypt. Uh, the next verse speaks of 70. And, uh, the, of course, the difference between them is, uh, the, between the 66 and 70, is Jacob, Joseph, and Joseph's two children, Manasseh and Ephraim, which were adopted by Joseph. But then when you get to Acts 7.14, there's five additional, and that just emerges from the fact that Stephen was using the Septuagint translation, which includes Joseph's grandsons. And so there were five additional to give you the 75. So it's a, uh, it's a, uh, uh, that, that explains the, the 70 that go down into Egypt. But one of the things we discover when we get to Genesis chapter 10, we have a chapter that's known as the Table of Nations. And we have Noah and his three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, and their descendants enumerated there in Genesis chapter 10. Under Noah, of course, we have Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Ham had Mithraim, Cush, Put, and Canaan. Shem had Elam, Asher, Arphaxed, Lud, and Aram. And Japheth had Gomer, Magog, Yavin, and Teres. And uh, what goes on in that, in that uh, uh, passage is we have detailed under each of them the uh, tribal names and, uh, uh, of, of, and their descendants. It's interesting, of course, that Mitzrayim is the name for Egypt. You and I think of it as Egypt, but often in the scripture we'll have the ancient tribal name of Mitzrayim referring to both upper and lower Egypt. And the Philistines came originally from from Egypt. Notice, by the way, that these are not sons of Ishmael. They're Hamites. And uh, it's, there's a lot of confusion as to what constitutes an Arab. Are you speaking eth ethnically? Then uh, certainly not the Hamites. Are you speaking geographically? Then you're speaking of Saudi Arabia. But in any case, also from Ham came Cush. Translated Ethiopia in your Bible, but it includes the Kassites. And it, they settled east of Assyria. Uh, the, uh, uh, some of them, and they uh, settled south of the second cataract of the Nile, the Cushites. Among them, of course, was Nimrod. He's the one that created Babel, the Tower of Babel. And uh, 
From him came Erech, Achaid, and uh, Kalna. And uh, that'll be detailed further in the 11th chapter of Genesis. But also under Ham came Put. Now he settled west of Egypt. And that's why it's translated Ethiopia in our Bibles. But it really refers to the North Africans, which are mostly Berbers and so on. And also a descendant of Ham was Canaan. Uh, from Sidon to Gaza and from uh, all the way to Sodom and Gomorrah, we have the Canaanites. But also descended from them were the Catites, from which we get the term Cathay, and also the Sinites. And that Sinoch is where we get one of the designates for China. So uh, some of these descendants found themselves in the Far East, and that's discussed in Isaiah 49, among other places. So those are the Hamites. Under Shem, we have Elam, which is the ancient name for the Persians, or what we call today Iran. We also have Asher and Arphaxed. Now, Arphaxed is the important one for us because from them came Sela, Eber, and Peleg. In the days of Peleg, the earth was divided. And then under him came a series of descendants which ultimately get to Terah and, of course, Abraham. Because from chapter 12 following, the rest of the Bible will really deal with uh, Abraham and his descendants, both spiritually and linearly. Uh, in addition to Arphaxed, we have Lud and Aram uh, from, uh, as Shemites. And then the... Uh, Third son of Noah was Japheth, and that's the one we associate with uh, uh, with uh, uh, Europe and so forth. We have Gomer, Herodotus, Plutarch, and others talk, uh, talk about the, the descendants of Gomer. The Cimmerians settled along the Danube and the Rhine. The Ashkenaz was a descendant of Gomer. It's a term that generally refers to uh, the Germanic peoples. And uh, Riphath, Josephus, uh, speaks of them as a, the uh, Phlegonians. And... Uh, the word Europe also comes from Riphath, strangely enough. Uh, ultimately derives from that in the, in the minds of some scholars. Also under Gomer was Tagarma, from which we get the Armenians. But not just the Armenians. They call themselves the House of Tagarma, but also parts of Turkey and Turkestan also trace the roots to Tagarma. So those are all Gomerites, if you will. A second son of Japheth was Magog, and of course that was the ancient Scythians, to use the Greek term. It's critical for our understanding Ezekiel 38 and 39 to understand the Scythians. Hesiod, which was a Greek didactic poet from the 8th century uh, B.C., uh, spoke much about them. But uh, we know a great deal of the uh, Scythians, or the descendants of Magog, from Herodotus, who was called the father of history, wrote about the 5th century B.C., and wrote a great deal about them because the Greeks were very interested in this the tactics and strategies of the Scythian military. So Gomer, Magog, the, the Medi, the Medes, the Kurds, and so forth, they emerged about the 10th century B.C., made a coalition with Persia to become the Persian Empire in the 7th B.C., 7th century B.C. Then we have Yavin, which is Ionia, or Greece, and under them we have Tarshish, apparently, and many people believe that might be an allusion to the British Isles. Then we also have Tiraz and uh, who deals with the Etruscans of Italy and others. So those are the sons. And the reason I bring, up, bring this up, if you go through Genesis 10, you'll discover there, there are 70 nations. So we have 70 uh, uh, nations in the table of nations in Genesis 10. And uh, we have 70 uh, tribes, if you will, uh, from uh, Jacob, uh, entering Egypt as a family and leaving Egypt as a nation Israel. Uh, summarized for us in Deuteronomy 10, 22, the last verse of our study this evening. The interesting thing we'll discover when we get to Deuteronomy 32, verse 8, that these two 70s are linked together. That uh, that's ex the scripture actually makes a point of this. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, verse 8 says, When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is, uh, is his people, Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. So there's very strange connection, if you will, uh, between the um, 70 families that went down as a family to Egypt that came out as the nation Israel uh, is linked uh, by the Lord himself, by the Creator himself, to the uh, number of nations, uh, which from a biblical perspective are 70. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see that whole theme develop as we go further in the Scripture. So that concludes our study for this session. We look forward to continuing these studies in session five. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.